In this video, I'd like to show you how you can practically use series termination in your digital designs. We will look at how I've implemented series termination resistor on this Queen B radio control PCB, which we've seen previously on this channel. We will look at a measurement setup using just a single channel on an oscilloscope with a fairly high bandwidth oscilloscope probe to measure the ringing, reflections, and general waveforms of a high speed clock line and how we can use series termination to our benefit to slow down edges, reduce reflections, and therefore reduce ringing, which in turn increases increases or improves our signal integrity and EMI performance. In previous videos on this channel, such as video number 121, we looked at series termination basics. And before you continue with this video, I'd strongly suggest looking through this as we go through in video number 121, why we need termination, why in particular series termination, and some of the theory behind series termination, which we'll be implementing in a practical real world sense in this video. In addition, it'll be useful for you to look through, if you haven't already, video number 145 on my channel, which goes over rise and fall times, the basics of why they are important as well as their measurement, as we will not be covering this theory again in this particular video. The particular PCB we will be looking at, again, is this Queen Bee PCB, which is, broadly speaking, a radio control PCB or transceiver for a mini quadcopter drone that I had built, and we've seen in some videos on this channel previously. We won't be going into detail on this particular PCB very much, other than that we have an STM32H7 microcontroller, which is linked via SPI to a CC2500 RF transceiver over some distance of trace or transmission line. For the sake of demonstration, all I'll be doing in this video for the firmware for the STM32H7 microcontroller is setting up an SPI clock line, which then links to the SPI clock input of the CC2500 RF transceiver in the top left. The path that's actually followed is from the top left pin of the microcontroller with a short length of trace, which is a lumped length of trace, into R64, which is our series termination resistor. And initially, this is just a placeholder zero ohm resistor, and we'll increase that value and see what happens to the waveforms. And that is fed then via a length of trace to the clock input, which is this bottom left pin of U3. In this way, we have an output series termination resistor. We have variable drive strength, which we can set up in the SM3287 microcontroller, and we can probe at U3 at the clock input and see what this RF transceiver is receiving in terms of SPI clock and if there are any signal integrity issues with that waveform. So a very, very simple setup, but something that applies to many, many digital systems and hopefully is useful across the board for whatever you are currently working on. If you'd like to explore this design in your own time, make sure to go to pms67.github.io and you can open the Queen Bee link, which is this Altium 365 interactive viewer, and you can look at the schematic and the PCB in your own time using just your browser. A huge thank you to JLC PCB for sponsoring this video. I had these Queen Bee radio control PCBs manufactured and assembled by JLC PCB, and they did an absolutely fantastic job. JLC PCB provides easy, affordable, and reliable PCB and PCBA solutions, which really empowers electronics engineers to develop projects efficiently and quickly. JLC is super easy to use. We simply have to click on instant quote, add our Gerber files if we just want PCBs, or if you want assembly, you can very easily add your PCB bill of materials and component placement files, and that's pretty much all you need. Their pricing is truly incredible. For instance, for six and eight layer PCBs at 50 by 50 millimeters, we only paid $2 for a set of five, which I think is pretty incredible. They can achieve this pricing due to large scale production, which reduces their and our costs. I've had a super good experience with JLC PCB, and I'm very grateful that they sponsor this channel. I can get my PCBs fully assembled back in about a week's time, which is amazing. Not only is their lead time super fast, but their quality is top notch as well. So I'd highly suggest you check them out. Links will be in the description box below as usual. Another huge thank you also to Altium for sponsoring this video. If you'd like to give the powerful Altium 365 platform a try, make sure to follow the link in the description box below or go to altium365.com forward slash YT forward slash Phil's lab and you can get yourself an Altium 365 free trial. Altium 365 brings many impressive features to Altium Designer, such as collaborative design, design reviews, mechanical co-design with SolarWorks, Fusion and more, manufacturing collaboration, easy bill of material management and much, much more. If you'd like to check out in part some of the core Altium 365 features, make sure to go to my GitHub profile or go to pms67.github.io and check out some example hardware designs that were shown on the YouTube channel and also for this particular video. You can check out a couple of the boards, for instance, the Queen Bee controller for the micro 
quadcopter using the Altium 365 viewer. You can check out the schematic, PCB, look into all the routing and all of the layers in real time. And also, of course, check out the 3D view, which I think is super useful, especially when you're sharing designs with people, maybe even outside of your organization. I'll leave links in the description box below and thanks for checking them out. Let's briefly look over the hardware and firmware setup before we do some measurements and see how to choose an appropriate value of series termination resistor. Again, we have an SM3287 microcontroller where I've set up SPI in master mode on the ST. We have one particular signal we'll be looking at in this video, and this of course applies to any time you need series termination, but this is an SPI clock signal. So originating from pin 132, PI1, which is an output drive on the ST or can be configured as one, we pass it through a series termination resistor, R64, we start off with zero ohms just as a placeholder value and then we can increase that resistance if needed based on what we measure later on. This is the RF clock net, which then gets fed to an RF transceiver, a CC2500 by TI. That gets fed into pin one of this RF transceiver U3, which is a high impedance SPI clock input. If you look at that on the PCB, just on the top layer, we can see pin 132 of the SM32 microcontroller. We have a very short length of trace at about four millimeters. So I've placed my series termination resistor R64 a lumped distance away from pin 132, as close as is feasible for this layout and as sensible for this layout, close to the output driver pin 132 of the STM3287 microcontroller, short length of trace and straight into my series termination resistor. From that, I have my RF clock net, which then leads straight via about a 75 millimeter length of trace into pin one of U3. What we want to probe is then close to this RF clock input of the transceiver. This is our load end. And this is where we want to see what the waveform looks like because that is what U3 is going to be seeing. So what we could do is, for instance, scrape a tiny bit of solder mask away above this trace, scrape a tiny bit of solder mask above this ground plane, and then use a low inductance connection from our oscilloscope probe where we probe our signal and our return path very close by to U3. And that's exactly what I've done. So here's a real world image of my setup. I have U3, I've scraped a tiny bit away of the solder mask, and I'm just using a close by ground connection. So I did scrape some solder mask away here on the ground plane, but this connection is still fairly low inductance given the probe ground clip I'm using. As long as we're probing a lump distance away from our load, which is U3 pin one in this case, and we're using a low inductance probing connection as so, we're trying to avoid these long typical oscilloscope ground clips. With this connection in place then, all I'm doing is feeding my scope probe into channel one of my oscilloscope, and this will form the basis of our measurement setup, so very, very straightforward. In STM32 Cube IDE, now let's briefly look at the software and firmware overview and setup. This is gonna be very simple. I've just configured my STM32 H7 microcontroller with the very basics, that's with a serial wire debug port for programming and an input external crystal oscillator. But all I've set up other than that is simply an SPI connection, the one that's mapped to the RF transceiver on the PCB. We won't be using SPI in full, of course. We are just looking for now and for demonstration purposes at the SPI2 clock signal. If I go to connectivity and then SPI2, we can say, see how this peripheral is set up. I set it up at a fairly fast board and clock rate. I set up my clocks so that I get 30 megabits out, meaning a clock rate of 30 megahertz. I've just done this to demonstrate the effects of series termination, especially when we get into shorter clock periods, that is higher clock frequencies, because we need faster edge rates. What we also saw in a previous video, video number 145 on rise and fall times, is the GPIO settings tab where we can adjust the maximum output speed. And that adjusts the ST's internal output drive strength. We saw from that video that we should choose that maximum output speed as low as possible. We have different options, low, medium, high, and very high. And you should go with the lowest option, lowest output drive strength, because that reduces the edge rates, improves emissions, and typically improves SI performance. It depends on the system you're running, what loads you have attached to the output drives and more. I'd like to start with the extreme case of very high and we will start with zero ohms, so no termination resistance on the output. With that very basic setup, all I'm doing is repeatedly in the main while loop calling SPI transmit. And of course, we're ignoring the MOSI and MISO signals and chip select. We just care about the clock signal being generated periodically. So that's what we can trigger off and check the waveforms on with and without various serious termination resistor values. So all I'm sending is an array of bytes just to trigger that clock signal. With this rather simple setup and code in place with the measurement setup we saw, let's start off again with a very high output drive strength, which is gonna be problematic as we'll see in a second, and a zero ohm resistor in place for the termination resistor. So no serious termination, a zero ohm resistor. 
Now with a zero ohm resistor in place, a very high drive strength setting on the ST's output driver, we can see we already have with our clock waveform significant problems. This is again measured at the input clock pin of U3, which is our high impedance load. Without any series termination, what we're seeing is a square wave so with significant overshoot, undershoot, and ringing, caused by a very high drive strength setting and no series termination. The fundamental frequency of this not really square wave, as we can see on the bottom measurement, is 30 megahertz. And I've also added measurements for the rise and fall times, as well as minimum and maximum amplitudes, so we can check out undershoot and overshoot. Keep in mind, this system is actually running off three volts, so the microcontroller and the RF transceiver. So that's what we have to base our measurements off, is zero volt and three volts as in minimum and maximum. With these settings, no series termination, we're getting very fast edge rates at about 650 and 800-ish picoseconds for rise and fall times, and we're getting quite high frequency oscillations due to the ringing, due to the reflections, about one volt of overshoot and about one volt of undershoot. So this is a pretty terrible waveform, and of course with undershoot, overshoot, you have to be careful of exceeding the absolute maximums of your devices that these are connected to. With ringing and fast edges, you have to be worried about EMI problems, because of course there's much higher frequency content now in the square wave in addition with this ring. So this is not a great waveform to have. Before we start adjusting the series termination, what you should always do is see if you can reduce the drive strength to a sensible value and then if needed play around with series termination. So let's do that first. Let's try and go to the other extreme where we change it from very high to a low output drive strength. And let's see if this works or if this will give us any other issues. This is now exactly the same code, except now I've reduced the drive strength all the way from very high down to low. And you can see this isn't great either. Now the rising and falling edges are so slow that we're not recovering the logic low part of this supposedly square waveform. So this might introduce other logic errors. We might not have good connectivity between our two ICs. The fundamental is still around 30 megahertz. Rise and fall times have now fallen down to five to six nanoseconds. We're not getting any overshoot anymore, but we're not quite reaching zero volts on the low logic level part of this waveform. So this isn't great either. Looks like we're gonna have to choose some sort of in-between drive strength. So what I'm gonna do is just increase that slowly from low to medium. You don't wanna jump straight up to the highest value. Again, you wanna get away with the lowest value you can. So going from low to medium already presents this rather interesting change. Low didn't look like it was going to work. We weren't quite hitting zero volts. The waveform looked pretty distorted, but just going one up in dry strength from low to medium already introduces quite a fair amount of overshoot, undershoot, and again, ringing due to reflections because we have an unterminated line. We start with a low impedance driver through a transmission line, reaching a high impedance load, a classic unterminated digital case. And this is why we're getting these overshoot, undershoot, and reflections. With a medium dry strength, zero ohm termination resistor, we're getting about 2 nanoseconds rise time, 1.6 nanosecond fall time. We're getting about half a volt of undershoot and about half a volt of overshoot. So this isn't great. Now we know that we can't choose a very high drive strength. We know we can't choose a low drive strength and we know we have to stick with a medium drive strength. Luckily, however, for us, other than playing with drive strength, we can play and adjust the value of R64, which is our series termination output resistor placed close to the output driver of our STM3287 microcontroller. So let's see what happens once we start increasing the value of R64 and see if we can minimize overshoot, undershoot and ringing. Moving from a zero ohm resistor to a 25 ohm series termination resistor, we can already see quite a significant improvement. Again, this is with a medium output drive strength and a 25 ohm series resistor. We can see the overshoot has been significantly reduced. There might be a tiny shade of ringing still left over, but this is again significantly improved. Looking at the minimum and maximum measurements, we can see we have up to about 200 millivolts of overshoot, which might still be okay, but our rise and fall times have slowed quite a bit to about 2.4 nanoseconds and 2.2 nanoseconds respectively. So this is already a great start and shows the effectiveness of series termination. So now let's try and increase this value and see if we can get any better results. Now this waveform is with a 33 ohm termination resistor. We still have a tiny bit of overshoot and undershoot. We can see we're getting about 100 millivolts undershoot, 100 millivolts overshoot. The ring looks like it's pretty much gone but it's a slightly underdamped response, rise and fall times at about just over two nanoseconds. This is already looking quite a bit better. This waveform is now with R64, our series termination resistor at 50 ohms. And this waveform looks pretty great. We have a fairly clean square wave with rounded edges. We're not really getting any overshoot, undershoot and no visible ringing, at least not terribly much of it. 
Our rise and fall times are around 2, 2.2 nanoseconds. And again, that max min amplitudes are well within what we would want for a waveform such as this. So a 50 ohms series termination resistor looks pretty good as well. With 100 ohms in place, this is what the waveform looks like. Actually, fairly decent. We're not getting any visible overshoot or terribly much undershoot, at least according to the measurements we have at the bottom, which is great. We've increased the rise and fall time, so we've slowed down the edges to about 3, 3.5 nanoseconds. So this actually looks fairly decent. I've recorded all of these values that we just measured, going from a series R of 0 ohms, so no series termination, all the way up to 100 ohms. Recording the rise and fall times, as well as undershoot and overshoot, these are fairly rounded values. With no serious termination, we had a very fast rise in fall times, and we had significant overshoot, undershoot. You can't get the ringing from just this table. But as we increase series R, the rise time already significantly slows down, and also the undershoot and overshoot goes down, which is a good thing. Past about 50 ohms, the undershoot overshoot didn't seem to go down terribly much, but rather the rise and fall times are increased. That means we get slower rising and falling edges. Essentially, we've reached the limits of series termination. All we're doing with increasing a series R in combination with the trace capacitance is that we're creating this RC low pass filter, simply speaking, which will just roll the edges off even more, reduce the rise and fall times. So for this case, it looks like for an undershoot overshoot of 50 millivolts, ish we should just go with a series r of 50 ohms and that might be the best value to choose in this specific scenario on this specific pcb which then gives us these rise and fall times if we want a faster clock if we change anything in the system we would probably have to redo this test because the output driver impedance of course depends on the loading if we'd like to estimate the driver impedance from the value we chose for the termination resistor and from our transmission line impedance we can give that a quick shot to see a ballpark value we chose our termination resistor to be 50 ohms, which gives us a pretty much critically damped response. So negligible overshoot, undershoot, no ringing, sufficient rise and fall times. That was with a 50 ohm termination resistor and the transmission line impedance we can calculate as well. From the Altium 365 viewer, we can see that my trace widths for the SPI lines, in particular the SPI clock line, is 0.25 millimeters, and my stack up is also contained there, although not the dielectric constant. That is, this is a microstrip line, so layer 1 with reference on layer 2, I have a dielectric thickness of 0.2104 millimeters. If I type that into a microstrip impedance calculator, using a dielectric constant of 4.6, a trace width of 0.25 millimeters, a trace to reference plane spacing of 0.2104 millimeters, and click calculate. This calculator will calculate the effective dielectric constant because this is a microstrip trace and an impedance of approximately 64 ohms for this trace. Meaning, if we remember back to the video on series termination, if we rearrange for output driver impedance, so ZS, that means ZS is Z0 minus RT, and Z0 is our transmission line impedance, which we calculated approximately 64 ohms, and our termination resistor is about 50 ohms to give us a critically damped response. That means our output driver impedance in this particular scenario looks to be around 14 ohms. Again, it depends on loading, depends on many other factors, and this is a very, very rough approximation calculation based on our measurements. I'll leave a link to this in the description box below, but I'd suggest checking out this article on driver's output impedance from IBIS models and IBIS files by Bert Simonovic, which goes through extracting or estimating driver output impedances based on typically publicly and freely available IBIS files and models, and I know ST has them for their microcontroller lines as well, and you could use this as an estimate or at least to get a ballpark number for the driver output impedance and given that you know your trace impedance you could get a ballpark value for your series termination resistor in this video we just showed it experimentally but this might be a different method if you don't want to just start with zero ohms or some random in quotes value Thank you very much for watching this video. I hope it was useful and I hope it showed you how you can experimentally figure out the right value of series termination resistor for your particular design and for your particular case with a very simple measurement using just one oscilloscope probe and one oscilloscope. If you liked the video, please leave a like, comment if you have any questions, and don't forget to subscribe to stay up to date with any latest PCB design, embedded systems, hardware, and firmware videos. Thanks again for watching and I hope to see you in the next video. Bye bye.